Hey guys, welcome back to Andrew Invest. Slightly spicy one today, I wanna to talk about everything money. So I've mentioned these guys previously in some of my videos, I used to watch them quite frequently, but now only watch them relatively occasionally. I do think there is some value to be had from watching their videos, but I do think they have a lot of weaknesses to their investing approach. So today I wanna to speak about what those weaknesses are, take you through them, and also talk about what they do well. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Okay, so to start with, what is Everything's Money approach to investing? Well, their usual video format starts off with them comparing a stock against their eight pillars. So let's go take a look at the actual eight pillars of Intel to understand the story of the company. Now, the eight pillars are effectively just eight different metrics or measures that they can measure a company against and see if they check the box. I'm not against that approach in general. I do think that a lot of their pillars are very conservative, almost too conservative. Pillar number one, we want the five-year PE ratio to be under 22.5. But I don't think it's necessarily a bad approach. They then go on to use a reverse dollar cash flow spreadsheet or input model in order to find a price at which they want to buy a stock at, assuming that some variables are constant in the future. So let's go run the stock analyzer tool just to determine what price to pay for the company based on a starting point. Now, I don't have any kind of problem with using this very numbers focused approach if you use it as a very, very loose guideline. But sometimes when you use things like reverse DCFs, it can give you a kind of false sense of security that when you buy into the stock at that price, it is going to be a win. And in reality, I don't think that everything money does enough research into the actual businesses and the stories of the businesses that they buy into as opposed to the numbers that they see on the balance sheet. And that leads them to fall into value traps very, very often. And it's happened numerous times in the past, including with Intel, stocks like Smith & Wesson, 3M. And right now, I personally believe they're also falling into the Disney value stock trap. Let's go look at it before COVID. Before COVID, they did $70 billion in revenue and had $11 billion in profit. That's what, 15% profit yeah. margin? Yeah. The year before that, 60 billion in revenue, 12 billion in profit, 20% margin. Year before that, 55 billion in revenue, 9 billion in profit, another 16, 17%. And every year you're talking about there, they didn't have Disney Plus, which is a high margin business. Correct. So my thesis on Disney is, if you believe that the profit margin is going to go back to, to normal levels, why are you not buying? Is this a buy? What they're doing here is taking a relatively shallow look at Disney's balance sheet over the years and seeing pre-COVID, pre-parks being shut down and ferries being closed. Look, Disney made so much profit before COVID. What if it could get up to the same profit margin after COVID? Well, that completely ignores the facts that why hasn't the profit margin recovered this year? Things haven't been closed for at least a year by now. And it also ignores the fact that Disney Plus is not a high margin business. It's actually very, very low margin. Well, even unprofitable at the moment, massively unprofitable. Netflix is the only platform that has actually managed to make streaming profitable so far. So I don't know what they're talking about with Disney Plus being a high margin business, supposedly. They also clearly haven't done the research into Disney's business model and seen the different sectors that it operates in. If they had, they would see that the Disney Plus part of the business is cannibalizing its legacy TV businesses, so much so that Bob Iger, the current CEO, has proposed selling off those legacy TV segments, which would make them a short-term profit and help them pay back some of their overwhelming debt. But it might not be the wisest idea in the long term if they can't actually produce any good Disney Plus content that encourages more subscribers to start. All right, look at how bad this looks. Oh 17 to 30, 82 to 106, 45 to 62. If you pay today's price and the low assumptions occur, you're gonna lose 8.8% .8 according to our assumptions. So I think this is really ironic because they actually come to the conclusion that Disney is a buy 
in spite of their reverse DCF model saying it's not, which is one of the few times that I think they should actually 100% listen to their model and not just ignore it. Why don't they ignore it when their DCF model tells them that Visa is overvalued or Apple is overvalued? It's, it's a strange one to me. That brings me on to my next criticism of their approach. They have extremely conservative numbers when it comes to price to earnings ratios for companies when they do their reverse dollar cash flow model. So Paul here predicts the price to earnings ratio for Visa after 10 years. Maybe 16. But as you said before, if they have a high growth rate and or a high ROIC, return on invested capital, you should pay a premium. So for a company like Visa, my low number is gonna be 15. Just start out with the low number, but I'm gonna go higher from there. I usually go, I'm actually gonna pay a little bit of a, I'm gonna go 18.5 and 22. So he says that for companies with really high ROICs, return on invested capitals, profit margins, and quality, as well as moat, you should assign a higher price to earnings ratio to companies like that because investors will turn to them in times of danger and in times when the rest of the market is going down, they will assign a premium to them because they're effectively safe bets. And yet he offers his midterm estimate for PE after 10 years as 18.5, which is really low. Even with the high estimate of 22, Visa hasn't had a price to earnings ratio that low in its entire existence as a publicly traded company. Let's go back to 2013 and try to value what Visa would be in 2023 and look at the price to earnings ratio then and let's say performed Paul's model, reverse DCF model on it. I wonder what number he would have put in for the price to earnings ratio today whether it would be higher than the 28 back then or lower. And he definitely wouldn't have predicted that today it would be over 30 higher than it was then. I have a low price of around 120, a high price around 210 to 220, and a mid price of 160 to 170. So with those really conservative estimates, we've established that he never would have got in on Visa stock at any point over the last 10 years, even though it outperformed the S&P 500 by 3x over that same time period. And what I don't like about this approach is that a lot of people claim to be following a Warren Buffett type strategy. And when they say that, they mean his current strategy, not his original strategy. Because yes, there are differences. Warren Buffett originally followed a cigar butt strategy, very similar to what everything money is trying to do, but obviously in a way more efficient fashion. A cigar butt strategy is effectively when you buy a company which isn't that good, but it is undervalued and it's on its kind of last puff of its you know, life. Whereas he actually changed to a compounding model where you buy a good business at a fair price rather than buying any business at low prices. And that model has basically been what has led him to be the world's ever greatest investor. He's not afraid to pay high price to earnings ratios for stocks and companies that are high quality. That's what Paul seems to miss. You know, we, we always look at what a business does in terms of what it earns on capital. We want to be in good businesses. What we really want to be is in businesses that are going to be good businesses and better businesses 10 years from now. And we want to buy them at a reasonable price. But many years ago, we gave up what uh, I've labeled the cigar butt approach to investing, which is where you try and find a, a really uh, uh, kind of pathetic company, but it sells so cheap that you think there's one good free puff left in it. And, and uh, uh, we used to pick up a lot of soggy cigar butts, you know. I mean, I had a portfolio full of them. Uh, and there were free puffs in them. I mean, it, I made money out of that. But A, it doesn't work with big money anyway. And, and, and B, we don't find many cigar butts around that we would be attracted to. Now, Buffett basically perfectly encapsulates why buying high quality companies at reasonable prices is a much more effective strategy than buying cigar butts here. And personally, I think that the prices Everything Money is looking to buy some of these high quality companies at is very cheap, not reasonable. And if you're them, you're effectively going to be waiting around for years 
trying to time the market, trying to buy a company at a very low PE, rather than just buying it at an acceptable price and hoping it will compound over the future. Personally, I'd much rather be in a high quality compounder that I know will be growing and still solid in 10 years, like Visa, than be in a soggy old cigar bar like Smith & Wesson. So if you did enjoy the points from this video and enjoyed the format of this video, please let me know in the comments and give me a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you for watching and I'll see you guys next time.